So the second part of the cranial nerves start with cranial nerve number seven. So we will continue from seven uh, to 12. And so we should start repeating uh, the developmental view of the cranial nerves, as you can see on this figure. Yeah, I will go briefly again uh, through the details. So we can uh, distinguish something which is called basal plates, which is motor, and alar plate, which is sensory. Uh, as for the basal plate, this this part, uh, this part is somatomotoric and somatic, coming from somites. And for, for today, we will need this. Yeah, so the hypoglossal nerve. A bit laterally to it are a younger branchiomotor or branchial somatomotor nuclei. So we will need this, which is facial nerve, and then the complex of glossopharyngeal vagus and accessory nerve together with this one. Yeah, so they will supply, uh, they will supply the third, sorry, the second, and third and fourth and sixth pharyngeal arches, yeah? The fifth is not here as it is not developed in humans at all. And then we have the last, which is the area uh, which is the visceral area. So we have the visceromotor here, and for the visceromotor, we have for the facial nerve this nucleus, and for the glossopharyngeal this, we call it salivary nucleus, yes, yeah, superior and inferior, salivary, you can hear salivation, and salivation uh, is one of the main functions of these nuclei. Yeah, of these two. So superior inferior salivatory nucleus for salivation lacrimation. And then we have this uh, visceromotor nucleus for vagus nerve, which is important uh, mainly for glands and smooth muscles uh, of organs innervated by vagus. So it's GIT respiratory tract and heart. So there's the basal motor part. Then the sensory, again, the viscero is this one. It's the only, uh, only nucleus in this area, which we call a nucleus of solitary tract. And it's uh, corresponding to mainly to vagus. Then we have the somatosensory and somatosensory is trigeminal, but this spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve will also serve to, to vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves concerning the somatosensory sensation from mucosa of, of the head. And the last one is special sensory. And as you know, we have three special sensory nerves, oculum, uh, olfactory nerve, optic nerve for the smell and for uh, the vision. And then this one, vestibulocochlear, vestibulocochlear for balance and hearing. So this is just a, to review what we have done yesterday to understand uh, the modalities which are taken by the nerves. And now we can continue. So today we will talk about uh, uh, the arches The second arch, yeah. the second arch innervated by facial nerve, third arch innervated by glossopharyngeal nerve, and fourth and sixth are innervated by the complex of uh, vagus nerve and a part of accessory nerve. I will explain this this then later. Yeah. 
So, and again, what we should know about each nerve, it's, uh, it uh, comprises the name, Latin and English, and developmental type, nuclei, the name of the nuclei, the function of the nuclei, and the location of the nuclei, which is connected with the modalities, yeah, if it's somatomotor, visceromotor, somatosensory, viscerosensory, or special sensory. And then when, it, when the, where the nerve leaves the brain, mainly the brain stem, when it enters the skull, and how it then runs through the skull and outside the skull, especially vagus nerve, which is running down to abdominal cavity and to scrotum in male. Yeah. Then of course the branches and the supplied area and organs, and how we can examine the function of the nerve. There are some reflexes and what happens when the nerve is uh, entrapped, irritated, or injured. So let's start with the facial nerve. Facial nerve supplies facial or mimetic muscles, but before it has to pass through a very um, complicated course in or within the petrous part of temporal bone, as you can see here, quite close to tympanic cavity. Yeah. So, which modalities or which nuclei do we have? So we have somatomotor, yeah, for the facial nerves, and uh, for the facial muscles, I'm sorry, for the facial muscles, and they are muscles of the second pharyngeal arch, yes? And then, and uh, this covers majority of the fibers, yeah, two thirds of them. Smaller portion is a visceromotor one, and as we have said, all visceromotor fibers coming from the cranial nerves are parasympathetic. And it uh, serves to supply glands, salivary glands and lacrimal glands. Yeah? And it's called superior salivatory nucleus. And together with these fibers, run some smaller amount of fibers for taste, yeah? And this taste come mainly from two thirds, two th uh, anterior two thirds of the tongue, yeah? So this area. And also from palate, but mainly from here. And they come to so-called gustatory nucleus, taste nucleus, yeah? Gustus is taste in Latin. And the, uh, gustatory nucleus is part of the solitary tract nucleus. Yeah, I go back and show you the solitary tract nucleus. This is the nucleus which we have here, and this big one. Yeah, this is a visceral sensory nucleus, and its rostral portion is for taste and it's called gustatory nucleus. So this big viscerosensory nucleus is called a nucleus of solitary tract. Why it's called nucleus of solitary tract? Because from this runs a tract up, which is called a solitary tract, like a tract which is uh, alone and not accompanied with some other. It's quite a strange anatomical name, but uh, it happens in anatomy as you know. Okay, back here, so then, the visceromotor and taste fibers together we call intermediate nerve. Why intermediate nerve, as you can see here? The intermediate nerve means that it appears in between. The facial uh, nerve, its somatomotor part, and vestibulocochlear nerve, the nerve appears alone and then merges with the facial nerve. So sometimes it is called intermediate nerve, but altogether we call it a facial nerve. And these nerves leave the brainstem together. Where they leave the brainstem, I am just going to show you. Yeah, it's in this area. Here you can see the nerves. So vestibular cochlear and facial and they leave the brain stem in between the pons 
which is this area, and cerebellum. And I said the cerebellum is connected via these peduncles. Yeah. So these peduncles, these white matter cords, connect cerebellum, which is now cut. So the cerebellum would be here. Yes forming the roof of the th fourth ventricle, which is here. So the cerebellum is in this area and it's cut. And in the angle between pons and cerebellum, it leaves the brainstem. Yeah, we will come to this again in, in CNS, but now you understand what is on the cerebellar angle. So the nucleus is here and we have talked about uh, what's happening to the nuclei of a different origin. Yeah? In the midline, we have these nuclei, which are the somatomotor somite. Yeah? Third and fourth and sixth and twelfth. And then the younger ones are these, which is number five. Oh, it's not visible well, number five, and this is number seven. So these are the uh, branchial somatomotor, yeah, for the branchial pharyngeal arches. And they moved, and they moved from this, this way, yeah, they traveled, the groups of the neuron traveled during the development. So you can see how they traveled, and they formed such a loop here, yeah, and you can see that all of them form such a loop. But this loop is important only, this is for the glossopharyngeal and vagus and accessory. Yeah, so all of them form such a loop. And only in facial nerve is the loop important because it then elevates here a small hill, which he called colliculus, yeah, collical collical or colliculus. But below the colliculus, you can see is the nucleus of abducent nerve, yeah, as you can see here. So the colliculus is here, but below is the nucleus of abducent nerve, and it is encircled by fibers of facial nerve. So that's important. So this facial colliculus, it, hides below in the middle the nucleus of sixth nerve and in the periphery the fibers of facial nerve yeah so then the this we sometimes call an internal knee or genu yeah internal knee or genu we can see this again here on a section yeah. This is nucleus of abducent nerve and the facial nerve goes around and forms here so-called facial colliculus. And this is the fourth ventricle. And here should be cerebellum yeah, as the roof and pons is below. This is pyramidal tract for example, yeah, the ma major motor part, ma major motor tract. We will come to this again in CNS. Yeah? So now we leave the brain stem in pontocerebellar angle. And what else? Where we get? We get into the cranial cavity, into the posterior fossa of the cranial cavity, uh, into a subarachnoidal space, which is called pontocerebellar cistern. Yeah, the same name as the angle. Cistern is if we have the brain like this, yeah, one half of the brain, and then we have the covers. So this is one cover, which is called pia mater, yeah. And then you have another cover, which is called arachnoidea. And then you have another cover, which is called dura mater. And then you have the bone. And here is a space which we call subarachnoidal space, yeah? Filled with cerebrospinal fluid. 
And if the space has an enlarged part, these enlarged parts are called cisterns. So this just uh, has to tell you that it leaves the brain, gets into subarachnoidal space, into a cistern, and then out. We will talk about the cistern in brain, in brain again. Yeah, this is just to understand the, the name. We won't ask in the tests about the cisterns because we have not gone through them in detail. So where we continue? We continue from the posterior cranial fossa into uh, internal acoustic meatus. Its opening is called pore. Then we get into the meatus. Meatus means a corridor. And at the end of the corridor is uh, a door. And we call it a fundus. Yeah, I'm sorry. <coughs> and then starts the facial kennel. The facial kennel has got three parts and I will show uh, the parts in detail again. And at the end, it leaves the canal in an opening which is called a stylomastoid foramen. And then it enters a gland. And it's a parotid gland. And it passes through the parotid gland, yeah? which is very, very important. I will come to that later. So you can see it's quite complicated, yeah, running through uh, the internal acoustic meters, then through the facial canal, out uh, via stylomastoid foramen, and then into parotid gland. So what can help you are such uh, schemes, yeah? And here you can see what we have talked about, the facial nerve with motor fibers, yeah? and intermediate nerve with parasympathetic fibers and sensory gustatory fibers, yeah? Coming from three nuclei. Then we enter the pore, the meatus, and we end at the fundus, and then we enter the a facial kennel. And in facial kennel, there will be three Kennels. A kennel for great petrosal nerve, for stapedius, and for tympanic cord. And then we get out into stylomastoid foramen, into parotid gland. Yeah. So this is again an overview, and now let's go into the details again. Yeah, don't worry. So we start uh, in the meatus, internal acoustic meatus, and this is its fundus, yeah? So that's the termination, and the facial nerve gets in. So we can again draw it. You can easily draw it like, like a circle. This is ventral, yeah? And this is superior. So we have a transverse crest. We have a vertical crest, which is more visible here than here. And this is facial area yeah, for the facial nerve. The rest is for the other nerve which we have here. That's for uh, vestibular cochlear. And we will talk about this later. Yeah, This is for cochlear. And this is for vestibular part of the nerve. So we get in here, and that's the beginning of the um, facial kennel. This is a facial kennel. Now I'll try to show you how the facial kennel uh, looks like, how you can learn it. Yeah? It's like when you try to swim, not very well. Yeah? So usually you swim this way. Yeah? But the kennel has got a, a bit different shape. The first is this, yeah? So you go this way. If you look into, if you try it yourself and you look into at your hands, you can see that the hands and forearms go in a ventrolateral direction, yeah? So the first part is ventrolateral. I'll try to write it here. So it, this goes ventrolaterally. Then it comes to the geniculum. Yeah, you can see the geniculum here, a knee small knee or little knee, little knee. So now your wrist is the little knee and then you go the other direction, which is 
90 degrees to that. So first to go like this, ventrolaterally, then you turn and you go dorsolaterally. So you are still learning to swim. And then it's another bend here. So we went ventrolaterally, dorsolaterally, and then caudally, caudally down. Yeah. So you are really not swimming very well. You are swimming like this, then like this, and then down. Yeah. I'm not sure if it can help you, but uh, okay, I'll try it. So we have three directions. These directions we can transfer to the skull base. If you look into the skull base and you can see uh, foramen magnum, yeah, and cella uh, turcica, the Turkish saddle, yeah, so you are oriented. And in here we have We have the petrous part of the temporal bone with the internal acoustic meatus. Yeah, so this is internal acoustic meatus. So how the nerve runs now? Yeah, so as I said, the first part is ventrolateral. Yeah, so this is ventrolateral. The second part is dorsolateral. Yeah, you can see the directions. This is ventrally. Yeah. So ventrolateral, dorsolateral, and then down caudally. So it, it means you go now from here down. That means into the screen. Yeah. Is it clear? Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So now you understand how it how it really runs through the bone. So we have the first ventrolateral part, which is called labyrinthic part, because it's above the labyrinth. What is labyrinth? That's the cochlea, and then the vestibule, and three semicircular canals, yeah? So inner ear. Then from geniculum, it goes above the tympanic part yeah Ab above the tympanic cavity so here you can imagine a tympanic cavity and you know that we draw the tympanic cavity like a, like a square with a the circle yeah so this is a tympanic cavity so that's tympanic part and then it goes down between styloid and mastoid process yeah and it leaves in stylomastoid foramen that's why it's called mastoid part yeah so now you understand the names and now the branches okay we can see the branches here so we try to to draw them a bit so first uh, this one it's a somatomotor fiber somatomotor that means for skeletal muscle and it's for stapedial muscle yeah stapedial muscle is inserted on stapedius mus stapedius yeah on the bone as the bone looks like this it's inserted on the bone and it uh, holds the bone in the vestibular uh, window, yeah, in the so-called oval window or vestibular window, which is between the tympanic cavity and inner ear. So if it holds the bone here, it reduces the transmission of vibration from, uh, from the air. If you have some sound waves, the sound waves start to move tympanic membrane. Yeah, I'll try to, to show it on, on video a bit. Maybe you will understand it better yeah so you have some waves 
sound waves in the air, then they come to tympanic membrane, the tympanic membrane start to move. And what is above the tympa uh, be behind tympanic membrane is a chain of bones. Yeah, so the chain of bones start to move again. And then the last bone here is stapes. So I have a stapes and then the round, uh, the, I'm sorry, the oval window. And if the bones move, then you start to move uh, the fluid which is in the inner ear behind this oval window. Yeah, and when the muscle keeps stapes firm, then you do not transmit so much the base. Yeah, so it uh, prevents an acoustic trauma from too uh, too noisy uh, um, environment. Yeah. So this is the function of the stapedius muscle. And then of course we have other somatomotor fibers which continue here down and to facial muscles, yeah? All the facial muscles, we will talk about them later. So this is the somatomotor. Now let's talk about the visceromotor, yeah? Visceromotor. They come here and leave through the canal for the great petrosal nerve. Great petrosal nerve and the great, so they leave here, great petrosal nerve, and then they go into foramen lacerum and a pterygoid canal into pterygopelatine fossa. Yeah, so we come to a pterygopelatine fossa where is a ganglion. And the ganglion is called pterygopelatine ganglion. And then we supply some glands. Yeah? And which glands can we supply? We can supply a lacrimal gland in the eye. We supply nasal glands in the nasal cavity. We supply palatine glands. And we supply nasopharyngeal glands. Yeah, so four groups of glands. So if you think about a face, it supplies lacrimal gland in the eye, which is here. Yeah. Nasal glands in the nasal cavity. Palatine glands in oral cavity, and then in behind nasopharyngeal in nasopharynx. Yeah, so it keeps all these mucosa moistured. Yeah. So I hope this is also clear. So then we can add another visceromotor fibers, which runs this way. And they continue here into canaliculus of tympanic cord, of corda tympani. And corda tympani is a nerve running through the tympanic cavity and out, and out it gets via so called petrotympanic fissure. I have examined to several students and I have asked nearly all of them about the petrotympanic fissure because we need it for the corda tympani. Yeah? And the corda tympani then joins another nerve, which is a branch from mandibular. And you may know it as it innervates tongue. And it's a lingual nerve, yeah? So the corda tympani joins the lingual nerve and then supplies the tongue and it supplies its anterior third and of course only one side, yeah? But this is not so easy, yeah? This is for a taste. So, as we talk about the visceromotor fibers, the visceromotor fibers 
leave the lingual nerve and has to be synapsed. Yeah? We see the synapse here for with the visceral motor. It's the parasympathetic fibers, so they have to be synapsed. So they are synapsed near ganglion. It's called gan ganglion and it's submandibular ganglion located in a homonymous triangle, submandibular triangle, yeah? between mandible and both bellies of digastric muscles. So it's submandibular ganglion. It's interpolated. It gets back to lingual nerve and then it gets to here to the tongue and then to two salivary glands, submandibular gland and sublingual gland. So if you look here to the face, we have another supply here to the mouth from below and that, that's submandibular and a sublingual, yes? Okay, we miss only one big gland in this area which is not supplied by facial nerve. Could you give me the name of the gland which we miss here in this? We have talked about the lacrimal gland, the lacrimal gland, nasal glands, palatine glands, nasopharyngeal glands, and then now about supandibular sublingual and the lingual glands here for the tongue, for the anterior two thirds, that means the dorsum. But we still miss here one big gland. No, pterygoid is not a gland. Parotid gland, perfect. Perfect, parotid gland is the right answer. Parotid gland is not supplied by facial nerve, yeah. Parotid gland is supplied by glossopharyngeal. We will talk about this later. But all the majority of the other glands are supplied uh, by facial nerve, yeah. So, questions to that. Visceromotor fibers leave the facial nerve via two nerves. Great petrosal and corda tympani. Yeah, corda tympani. So they have two ganglia, pterygopalatine in pterygopalatine fossa and submandibular ganglion in submandibular triangle. And it, it supplies the majority of the glands, lacrimal, nasal, palatine, nasopharyngeal and lingual, submandibular, sublingual. So, and then the last is taste. The taste comes here, yeah, from this part of the tongue. Oh, okay, some other color, about this one. Yeah, so this is a taste from taste buds from the receptors and it goes the same way by a lingual nerve, tympanic cord, here back, here, but it, when it's a, Afferent structure, it has to be somewhere again synapsed. So it's synapsed here in the ganglion. In the ganglion, which is called ganglion geniculi. Yeah, the ganglion of the knee, of the little knee, ganglion geniculi. So it's synapsed here, and then it goes to the gustatory nucleus. So that's the taste from here. And we have a taste from palate. Taste from palate goes here, here, and here, and it's synapsed as well here. So this is taste from palate, this is taste from the tongue. Yeah, Taste from palate is of course uh, not so uh, important, but it still exists, yeah? There are some taste buds on the hard palate and soft palate. They synapse with what? Okay, they synapse with another uh, another nerve, yeah, it's just, uh, I draw it somewhere here. You have a nerve or an axon, yeah, and the axon has a synapse with another cell, yeah, with the pericarion, the soma, the body of another neuron, and then it continues, yeah, and this we call a ganglion if it's in PNS, yeah. Madina, you understand? So this is synapsing. And this synapse, in, uh, these ganglia are present in visceromotor. As you can see, the visceromotor was this pterygopalatine and submandibular. They are present in viscerosensory, somatosensory, and also here in taste special sensory. Yeah, this one. 
they are not present in somatomotor. So as you can see, this, these light blue ones, they are somatomotor. There is no ganglion, no special synapse. And back to the taste here, you can see that uh, the taste fibers pass through this ganglion. But this ganglion is visceromotor parasympathetic. So it is not the taste one. That's why it's not synapsed here. It's synapsed here. It just passes here yeah, to make it clear. So now it looks really terrible, this, this diagram, but I hope you have understood this. And why we learn it so in detail. So now think about some clinics. We can cut it. We can uh, entrap the nerve. We can harm the nerve by um, injury, tumor, or by a cold. If you get a cold, this nerve can also get swollen and can be entrapped and we can have some symptoms of palsy. So if we have palsy here at this level, then the problem will be in facial muscles. Which problem will be in facial muscles? I show you later because we have not talked about this yet. Yeah? And the more upper you go, the more symptoms you have. Because when the problem is here, we have the problems in facial muscles and we add problems in here. So which problems we will have? No taste on half of the anterior two thirds of the tongue, yes? And no salivation in these submandibular and sublingual glands and in these lingual glands, yes? But still you have the other side. So there will be some taste and there will be some salivation from the contralateral ones and from the parotid gland, yeah? And I said parotid gland is innervated by glossopharyngeal, yeah? Okay. Yeah, you understand this. When we have problem here, then the stapedius muscle do not contract. And as we said, the stapedius muscle reduces uh, the volume of the sound waves, then you can have problems with hearing, especially in a quite loud uh, or quite in a noisy uh, environment. You can feel or perceive all the sounds even as a pain. Yeah, they can be painful. They will be too loud and even painful if the stapedius muscle does not contract. Okay, when we move here and we make the problem here, what else appears? No function in these glands. So you will have half of these cavities dry and especially the eye will be dry because there will be no lacrimation, yeah, no lacrimation. So the whole eye will be very dry and I will tell you how it's called a bit later. So now you understand that according to all these symptoms, you can easily distinguish just seeing the patient in, in your uh, ambulance or in an outward, uh, outpatient ward. You just can find out where is the problem and you can then um, use the best imaging method to show uh, the exact part of the facial canal or facial nerve course. Yes? So questions to this. I will go again through the uh, branches and what do they supply and through the uh, muscles and uh, the palsy as well. Stapedius, please, yeah. So stapedius, the function of stapedius is, okay, I'll try to show it again on the video, yeah. You have the bones, yeah, mallows, incus, and stapes, and they form a chain. And if comes uh, a sound wave on the eardrum, they just move like this, yeah? A chain of bones. But the stapedius muscle keeps it whole, so they do not move so much. So the intensity uh, of transmission is lowered. That means you do not hear so well. For example, if you go to a concert, and you go out from, from the concert, then uh, you have a feeling that you do not hear so well and it takes some time, yeah? Because the stapedius muscle is by reflex contracted for longer time. 
So the staperius muscle helps, uh, keeps you or restrains you from a, a noise harm of, of the inner ear, of the hairy cells there. What exits there? I do not understand, Marina, what means what exits there. What is tinnitus? We will talk about tinnitus uh, later, Vladimir. Yeah? If you can wait, I will explain. There is an arrow exiting. Uh, you mean this one? That's the, yeah, the stapedius muscle is, is in the pyramidal eminence. Yeah, so it should be like this. Okay. So if you have no other questions, I can go on. So here again, you can see a different different figure showing you uh, the labyrinthine part, the uh, geniculum and the great petrosal nerve, the tympanic part, and the dis, uh, descending mastoid part, yeah? With the stapedius nerve and the corda tympani. Yeah, running out in petrotympanic fissure. So, which are the branches? Just to review them, greater petrosal nerve supplying uh, via parasympathetic visceromotor fibers, four group of glands, the lacrimal, nasal, palatine for heart and soft palate and nasopharyngeal, yeah, for nasopharynx. The same, Via corda tympani to lingual, supplying the anterior two thirds of the dorsum, submandibular and sublingual. So these are visceral motor branches. Then we have the taste branches. Taste branches come from ventral two thirds of the dorsum of the tongue, yeah? And they also come from palate through the petrosal nerve. It is not written here but there are some small taste coming from palate, yeah? Some taste fibers coming from palate. And then we have these somatomotors, tapedial nerve for tapedial muscle. And then we get out, and we get out and, and supply different muscles. So we said that the stylomastoid for a man is between styloid process and mastoid process. Yeah? And you have two muscles which are inserted here. One of them is stylohyoid and the other which is inserted to a uh, notch, to a mastoid notch, is called posterior belly of digastric. Yeah? So these two are supplied by the facial nerve as the facial nerve exits here and supplies them, yeah? There's a question, is the taste sensation in the area of soft palate or hard palate, uh, both, both. Then we have another branch which goes here to the auricle, yeah? So you can think here is the auricle. And we have some muscles here. And these muscles are rudimentary muscles of the auricle. We have not talked about them until now, but it is not necessary to know the names. And then three small auricle muscles, which keeps the auricle fixed and which moves it a bit, yeah? Yeah, SH is stylohyoid uh, muscle, yeah? SH here is stylohyoid muscle. I'll try to show you what the auricular muscles do. Try to look at me. I don't know if you see how my auricle is moving. Could you see it, please? Just right. Oh, okay, okay. So for this are the uh, these muscles, yeah, and these fibers, and the nerve is called posterior auricular nerve yeah so it's this one so the facial nerve supplies muscles of the auricle then two suprahyoid muscles which is stylohyoid and posterior belly of digastric 
and then gets into parotid gland and branches into five branches. Into which branches? This slide just shows you uh, the topography. Yeah, we have talked about that. Uh, I'll come. I'll come back to all these. Now you can see the branches. Yeah, you can see the five branches supplying then the muscles, and the name of the five branches is here. But before we start to talk about these five branches, the nerve is divided into two main branches, which is well visible here. Yeah. I'll mark them. And this is information not present in majority of the anatomical books. We call them superior and inferior branch. And we will need this uh, for understanding of the paralysis of the facial nerve. Yeah? Because this superior branch, you can see, supplies the muscles around the eye and we have here a muscle which is called orbicularis oculi muscle. And the inferior branch supplies muscles which are here, and we have the orbicularis oris muscle. Yeah? And we will have different symptoms from uh, in, uh, palsy or paralysis of these branches. So please remember that the facial nerve branches into superior and inferior, and then and they continue in branching, yeah? Again, so the superior goes to the eye and the inferior goes to the mouth and then to the neck as well, like that. And it is all hidden in parotid gland, which is not visible here, so the parotid gland would be here. That's why we call it intraparotid or parotid plexus, as is written here, yeah, intraparotid plexus. So first branching into superior and inferior and then into five final branches. In this figure you can see how the nerve runs uh, through the bone. It's 3D reconstruction from CT, so you can see the labyrinthine part, the geniculum, uh, the tympanic part and the mastoid part. This is tympanic cord. Green is tympanic membrane, and uh, blue are uh, hammer and anvil and a stirrup, so malleus, incus, and staples. And what is violet is the cochlea inner ear, so cochlea, vestibule, and three semicircular canals. The question is the plexus underneath the parotid gland, or does it go through? It goes through the gland. That's why it's called intra, intra parotid. Yeah, it is inside. Why it's important? If you have a tumor of the gland, you have to remove the tumor and the gland. And usually, you remove part of the nerve, and you cause an artificial iatrogenic palsy. Yeah, and I will show you how you can repair it then and restore the function. So this is the innervated area. Yeah, it's it's half of the anterior two thirds. Without and it's not drawn properly. It should be like this. It's without the uh, valate papilla. Yeah. So the valate papilla, they are already innervated by glossopharyngeal nerve. Yeah. So it's without the valate papilla. So now uh, these five branches, how we call them? You can see this and you can apply your hand nicely on the face. I'll try to show you uh, in a camera, but it does not work so nice, but this figure can help you very easily. Yeah, you put one finger on, uh, on the, how it's called in English, in Latin it's tempus, where is the temporal bone, the squamous part of the temporal bone. So this is one finger. Temple, thank you very much, Marina. <laughs> Temple, yeah. The other finger you put on a, on a uh, cheekbone, so on the zygomatic bone here. The third you put just on the cheek towards the mouth. The fourth you put on the edge of mandible. So the nerve is called marginal nerve of mandible. 
yeah I may skip to this to show you the names yeah here you can see the names so the temporal for the temple zygomatic for the area above zygomatic bone buccal uh, over uh, the cheek marginal mandibular branch running along the inferior margin of mandible and cervical or ramus or ramus coli yeah cervical branch beware of this this is buccal these are buccal branches yeah so buccal branches rami buccalis but what about buccal nerve do you know from which bigger nerve does the buccal nerve or buccal nerve branches because this is somatosensory not maxillary no but it's trigeminal yeah so it's from mandibular it's branch from mandibular so it's somatosensory yeah and buccal branches which comes from facial are somatomotor yeah please do not mix this yeah buccal nerve somatosensory from mandibular buccal branches somatomotor from facial yeah that means they are for muscles and somatosensory for the skin of the cheek and for the mucosa of nasal cavity in the extent of the cheek yeah so these are five names of these five branches and you can see here the superior and inferior branch and the cervical branch is then running uh, on the neck supplying platysma and having a connection with transverse cervical nerve you may know this nerve already from plex, uh, cervical plexus as one branch running uh, in a horizontal uh, plane across the neck to supply this area and there's a communication which is called superficial cervical anza yeah superficial cervical anza it's not clinically important but you can you can uh, see it and you should know that it's not a clinically important structure so you can cut it without a problem yeah during operations which nerve innervates the fascia over buccinator uh, yeah that's a good question and uh, of course uh, now I now I go a bit uh, to another topic and I, I may draw it yeah so you understand this superficial cervical anza is a connection between the cervical branch and the transverse cervical nerve and it has no clinical significance you can you can cut it if, if you meet it during operation so uh, and I'll go back to the answer to this but I think I will need some space for that so when we have a somatomotor fibers yeah, which goes into the muscle to move it in every muscle you have muscle spindles I hope you know the muscle spindles yeah? these are alpha motor neurons which moves the muscle and we have some gamma motor neurons which moves the muscle spindle the muscle spindle is a receptor which we have uh, to find out how the muscle is stretched but we also use it to prepare how we stretch the muscle if you want to perform a movement so from which muscle from this muscle spindle we have a somatosensory fibers but we do not call them somatosensory we call them proprioceptive fibers proprioception yeah which informs you about the stretching uh, about uh, yeah how the muscle is stretched or relaxed and the same comes from tendons and fascia yeah so the same information comes from tendons and from the fascia what is the red one 
yeah, the red one, it's uh, so-called gamma loop. We will talk about this, this, I, I think later. If you have not talked about the gamma motor neurons in physiology, and if not, you will talk about that. It's a fiber which is a somatomotor motor fiber, but for the muscle fibers which are inside the muscle spindle. Yeah, muscle spindle, a smaller receptor. But we will devote some time to this later when we talk about, uh, about the muscle spindles. So is it enough like that? Okay, thanks. So then come back. Now we know these five branches and we know all the branches. So now we should understand uh, how the paralysis looks like. I hope you all uh, know the pyramidal tract. The pyramidal tract is the main uh, motor tract which we have in the brain. It starts somewhere in the cortex in an area four. We have talked yesterday about area 28 for smell, area 17 for vision, area four is the main motor area, primary motor area. Yeah, here is a neuron which we call upper motor neuron and it gives an impulse and the axon goes down. It's decusated, decusated at the level of C1. Then you go down to the alpha motor neuron in the anterior horn, yeah? And from here, it goes to the muscle. This alpha motor neuron is called lower motor neuron. Of course, there's a synapse, yeah? So to perform a movement, you need just two motor neurons, one in the brain and the other in the spinal cord. In case we do not speak about the spinal nerve, we speak about the cranial nerves. The alpha motor neuron is not here. The uh, neuron is in brain stem. Yeah? The alpha neuron is here. So how is it with the decusation? Yeah? Now we have to concentrate on the decusation. For the spinal nerves, all the fibers are decusated. For the cranial nerves, it's, it depends on the nerve. So let's talk about facial nerve. So for facial nerve, we have central and peripheral palsy. We start with the peripheral, which is easy, and we have already talked about. So here you can see this is, this is the nucleus of facial nerve. Yeah. Nucleus of facial nerve in pons. And if you destroy the nucleus, or if you destroy somewhere the nerve, what happens? We have talked about uh, the problems with the glands and taste, but of course we have problems with the muscles. What will happen? The orbicularis oculi won't work very well. Yeah and your uh, lower lid will be dropped down. We call this lagophthalmos. Lagophthalmos, when lagos means a hair, yeah? Hair, not the hair which you have on the head, but uh, an animal called hair, like similar to rabbit. Yeah, so it should look as an eye of an hair. Yeah, so look at my eye, it should look like this. Yeah, the lower lid is lowered. Yeah, it's like that. And the hair should have the, the eye like this normal, and that's why we call it like that. Yeah, you understand? Okay. So that's here for orbicularis oculi. And for orbicularis oris, what happens? The, low, uh, the lower lip is also lowered like this. So the saliva can then drop and it looks like this. Yeah, you can see me. 
hair like this. So the patient has got a hair eye, like of Talmus, and a dropped mouth angle. Yeah? These are two most important symptoms. You understand that? No problem. Please let me know. Ah, is there somebody who can tell me if you understand it? You do not understand, okay. I will repeat that, yeah? So, if you have problems, yeah, you did not really get the hair part, okay. So, uh, I will repeat all the things, yeah? So, if you have a problem in the facial nerve, that means either in the body of the neuron, yeah, pericardion, the soma, or in the axons, we can have problems with the facial muscles. So, we can have problems with the orbicularis oculi muscle, yeah? And the orbicularis oculi do not contract so well, so the lower lid, the lower lid is lowered more, and it should look as a hair. Hair similar to rabbit, yeah? Hair is an animal similar to rabbit. So the eye looks really, as I showed, I tried to show again, not like this, but like this, yeah? So the eye look as a, an eye of a hair. That's why it's called Lagophthalmos, yeah? You understand Madina now? Yeah, half of the face is paralyzed, Lucas. So we can call it facial hemiplegia. Yeah, we can call it a facial hemiplegia. Yeah, and the same is here with the orbicularis oris. Yeah, it is also lowered like that. Okay, so Daniel, you understand? Half of the face as I covered it does not work. Okay. So that's the peripheral. Now central one, yeah? So the problem is not in the nerve, uh, in the lower motor neuron, in the nucleus, but above. Usually either in the brain uh, itself, that means in the cortex, yeah, in the area four, or on the way. And the most common places here, it's called internal capsule. We will talk about that. A bleeding in the internal capsule, which causes usually a stroke. So then it causes the problems. And if you can see these fibers, go here and here to upper and lower part. Yeah. So the upper and lower part also gets information from the other side. You can see here, the upper part, yes. But the lower part, no. That means the upper part still can move. So there is no problem with the eye, but the lower part could not move, yeah. So there is no function. That means there is no function. And you have again, the dropped mouth angle. Can you go back to the previous one, please? I don't have the slide. Yes, I can after you understand this. So, what is the difference between central and peripheral? Yeah, Central means only lower part is affected because the lower part gets only contralateral information, as you can see here or here. Just decussated fibers. But the upper part gets fibers both from one side and the contralateral one, yeah? So it's doubled. And we don't know why it's like that. So the problem will be only in the lower quarter, yeah, of the face on contralateral side. So you understand this?
Okay. So when I clear it, I'll go back here. Sorry, to the peripheral one. Yes, these these two slides uh, are not in the presentation. I will uh, I have done them in the morning just to try to explain it more. I will uh, put uh, both on the website then when we when we finish. Yeah. So please remember the peripheral policy is ipsilateral or homolateral, so on the same side, and it's the full half of the face. But the central one is contralateral and it's only a lower part of the half face that means lower quadrant contralateral yeah this is very important the most important information from the facial nerve and how the patient looks like yeah so the patient looks like this so you can see first the peripheral policy in the peripheral one you can see problems with the eye could not close the eye so eye over hair lag of thalmus yeah and then problems of the angle the angle is a little bit dropped here yeah and if you try to smile or uh, frown no movement here yeah so we have problems in the eye and in the mouth no frowning as you can see here yeah no frowning no smiling in the central policy there is not a problem here uh, sorry there's a problem here uh, undo yeah you can see here uh, he tries to to frown or smile but here nothing happens but we're frowning here that's fine so central policy is only the lower part, peripheral is both upper and lower, yeah? Can you explain the neuralgia that can happen in facial nerve? There is no neuralgia here, yeah? This is not a neuralgia. Neuralgia is only in a somatosensory nerve, like trigeminal glossopharyngeal. This is not somatosensory, there is no somatosensation, so there is no neuralgia. Yeah, there's only policy or paralysis. So when I come back to all this to summarize, yeah. So we, when we have the affection of the branches of facial nerve, so we have a policy or paralysis of facial muscles, which means dropped or sect mouth angle, yeah, and saliva gets out. You have drooped or a lowered lower lip, which is called, according to the hair, lag of thalmus. And you are not able to get wrinkles on the forehead. Yeah, you are not able to frown. You are not able to whistle. You are not able to play flute, for example. So this is for the muscles and the other ones. Of course, no taste on palate, but mainly ventral two thirds of the tongue. So it's called the hypogeusia. Maybe you have read now about coronavirus that in some patients you can have anosmia. And we have talked yesterday about anosmia in uh, olfactory nerve uh, injury, yeah? So please remember these terms, which can be very useful in your future uh, life of physician. So hypogeusia, less taste, yeah? Or agousia, no taste in the affected half of the anterior two thirds, so in this area. Then no function of submandibular and sublingual glands, which means dry mouth, yeah? Stoma, mouth, xeros is in Greek dry. So dry mouth, xerostomia. But this is on one side, on the other side, the glands work, so it's weak symptom, yeah? 
then another problems of the visceral motor area when we talk about the greater petrosal nerve no lacrimal gland and when there is no function of lacrimal gland we have dry conjunctiva and dry cornea which leads to dry eye ophthalmos eye xeros dry so xerophthalmia and why is the eye dry this is one reason and this is the other reason dropped lower lid yeah so you have two reasons why the eye which stays open is dry and then of course no secretion of the nasal palatine and nasopharyngeal glands in half of the cavities so it's a weak symptom but it's there so this is full peripheral policy of the nerve. Full means that it happens in the first part of the facial canal. Yeah. And I have forgotten this one. As we have talked about the stapedius muscle, which uh, helps us to overcome some, some noisy environment. So if it does not work, we have sharp or painful uh, hearing, which is called hyperacusis. Hyperacusis. So, question to this. So, you see, facial nerve is quite complicated based on what it supplies and how it runs through the petrous part of the temporal bone. If you have no questions, perfect, then we can have a break until. 11.20 and then we continue, yeah? So to conclude the facial nerve, not only palsy can happen, but also similar to, uh, I'm sorry here, I just need to, uh, explain that what is what is hidden by by the figures it is uh, similar to trigeminal nerve as for what happens that the nerve can be compressed just at the border of uh, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system sheathes of the oligodendrocyte and schwann cells which we called obersteiner red so yeah and uh, it is also caused by a loop of an artery and the name of the artery is Arteria of Cerebellum and it's called uh, inferior anterior one, yeah? So it's anterior inferior cerebellar artery which can cause the problem, yeah? And then it uh, interrupts the nerve and it causes its irritation and you can see that the uh, patient here frowns too much and smiles too much so that's the irritation so a cramp of the muscles and we can treat it with injection of botulotoxin yeah, which is paid by the insurance companies in this case but it's quite rare more uh, often you meet uh, much more often you meet the palsy and if we have to remove the parotid gland due to a tumor and we cut the branches, we are not able to keep the branches safe here, we can use a neurosurgical transplantation and we use the different nerves. We can use the sural nerve, yeah? So the transplantation of the sural nerve, which we take from the inferior limb, or we can use a nerve which is close we cut it and we just uh, move it, yeah? We use greater auricular nerve or hypoglossal nerve. So these are three uh, kinds, three options of uh, neurosurgery in this area. Yeah, yeah, we can transplant the nerve, but the nerve does not work uh, just at once, yeah? But it starts to work after the fibers grow through. If you transplant the nerve here, the nerve uh, serves only as a scaffold, yeah, as a, as a conduit. And the nerve fibers need to grow again through. And the speed of growth is one millimeter per day only. Yeah. So it will take some time. Okay, so that's all for the facial nerve. 
now let's talk about the vestibular cochlear. There's the only special sensory nerve which has got uh, its nuclei within the brain stem. All term is start to acoustic and it can tell you that it's for uh, balance and hearing. Yeah, and vestibular cochlear tells you that it goes into the vestibule and the cochlea of the inner ear, which you can see here. So the inner ear is composed of three parts of the cochlea, the vestibule and three semicircular canals and ducts. As you can see, the vestibular cochlear nerve leaves together with the facial nerve in pontocerebellar angle. And the most common tumor of the peripheral nerves is, uh, or uh, can appear here, it's called the neurinoma of a acoustic nerve yeah this is used in clinics this this term neurinoma of acoustic nerve yeah that's a tumor of this nerve and the symptoms can be either symptoms of the vestibular cochlear nerve or a compression of the facial nerve so the peripheral policy of the facial nerve yeah due to this close relationship of both nerves so Let's continue. The vestibular cochlear nerve has got six nuclei, two cochlear nuclei, yeah, for audition. And they are called anterior and posterior. And four vestibular nuclei, which are called superior, inferior, medial, and lateral. Yeah, I'll show you in a figure. Then the nerve leaves the pontocerebellar angle. And as the facial nerve gets into the posterior cranial fossa, internal acoustic pore and uh, internal acoustic meatus and gets to the fundus. And here it divides into the vestibular part for balance and the cochlear part for hearing. Because it's a special sensory, that means afferent nerve, there has to be a ganglion. The ganglion of the vestibular nerve is located on the floor of the meatus, yeah, so within the meatus. But the ganglion for hearing is inside the cochlea. And, and you know, the cochlea has got a spiral shape. Also, the ganglion has got a spiral shape, yeah, and we will talk about this ganglion in detail in ear. Well, Madina has got a question, but I do not understand the question. Maybe if you could write into not a private chat so everybody can see what you are asking. In the meantime, I just show you the nuclei. You can see that the nuclei are the most lateral, yeah, because they are special sensory. These two are cochlear, anterior and posterior, and here are four. Uh, vestibular superior, inferior, medial, and lateral. Yeah. So these are the nuclei. And then we continue into the nerve. Yeah. Here you can see the nerve. This is this is a model, but very nicely it shows uh, the cochlear nerve running into the cochlea. Yeah. And the vestibular nerve with the ganglion. That's the ganglion vestibular, yeah? And you can see that the nerve then divides into three branches. One, two, and three. And we will talk about these branches just in a minute. So the question of Madina is, only two nerves are affected by neurinoma? No, no, I said that the most common neurinoma appears in the vestibular cochlear nerve, yeah? So the most common neurinoma in human is the neurinoma of vestibular cochlear nerve. And it can cause problems, either uh, paralyzing the function of vestibular cochlear nerve or compressing the facial nerve, which is just next to it. So a first symptom of neurinoma of the vestibular cochlear nerve can be a peripheral policy of the facial nerve. Okay, so let's let's move here back to the vestibular vestibular nerve. 
So the vestibular nerve enters into the uh, fundus of the internal acoustic meatus. Yeah, this was for the facial nerve. We do not care about that. And this is for the cochlear nerve, yeah? And you can see how the spiral is visible here. So this is the area for the cochlear nerve, yeah? Anterior inferior quadrant. And the vestibular area is here for the other ones. So we have the superior and the inferior posterior quadrants. And then another small opening, which is called foramen singulare, yeah? Singular opening, something like solitary or lonely opening just alone here. So we have three openings for three branches of the vestibular nerve, yeah? So these all are for three branches of the vestibular nerve. So let's come closer to them. You can see them here, yeah? And I'll try to draw it. So again, the fundus of the uh, external internal acoustic meters. Yeah, this is facial nerve. This is cochlear, and then we have these. And this is the superior vestibular area, and this is inferior vestibular area, and this is so-called. Foramen singulare, yeah, singular foramen. And now the three branches. We have an nerve which is called saccular, and it innervates saccule. I will show you the saccule in a minute, yeah. Then we have an nerve which is called posterior ampullar, and it supplies the posterior ampulla of semicircular duct. And then for the rest, we have utricular ampullar. Yeah, so here we have utricular ampullar. And the utricular ampullar then supplies utricle, that's the other sac in vestibule, and then another two semicircular ducts. Yeah, we have three of them. So we have an anterior ampullar and lateral ampullar. Okay, I'll try to keep this for next slide to show you. So, here we see the internal ear, yeah? And this is cochlear for the cochlea. And this is vestibular yeah, with the ganglion here. And then we have three branches. Saccular is this one. So you can see here the saculus, yeah, and this is saccular. The saculus and the utricle, saccule and utricle, serves for linear movements in two different planes. So if you move your head up and down, and if you move it uh, forward and backwards and to the sides, these two, saccule and utricle, informs you about this movement. And then we have this semicircular duct which are membranos inside semicircular kennels, yeah? So we have a semicircular kennel, which is bony, and inside you have semicircular duct. And this is an enlarged part, which is called ampulla. And inside the ampulla, we have another receptor, and the receptor is for uh, movements which are rotatory, and it's for Initiation of the movements and uh, initiation of the movements and stop of the movements. Yes. Yeah? So if you start to move your head to this in a, a rotation or if you stop it. So I'll try to show you maybe on video. So the saccule and utricle. Saccule and utricle are for these movements, yeah. Forward and backwards, to the side, up and down, yeah. Just the linear movements, the saccule and utricle. And the semicircular ducts, ducts are for rotatory movements, like this. But they do not register the movement itself, but they register the beginning at the end. That means the acceleration and the deceleration. So they register this, you start to move. That's the acceleration. And then if you move, you stop the move. 
so the deceleration. Yeah, we will talk about the details then later uh, in the year, in census chapter. But just to understand now that we have more nerves, yeah? Posterior ampullary nerve here and here. This was the utricular ampullar, yeah, which you can see here, supplying the other ampulla. Yeah, so we have posterior semicircular duct, we have anterior semicircular duct and we have lateral. I think you may know these ducts uh, as uh, we have already uh, learned some of, of these structures during study of the skull. Yeah? And these bony structures are This is a vestibule. Yeah, so inside the vestibule you have the saculus, sacul and utricule. Then the anterior duct or anterior semicircular canal causes something which is called arcuate eminence. Arcuate eminence is on the anterior surface of temporal bone. Then the lateral one causes a prominence of lateral semicircular kennel inside the tympanic cavity. Yeah, when we have the inside the tympanic cavity, then we have additus to mastoid antrum and in the additus to mastoid antrum there are two prominences. And one of them is the prominence of lateral semicircular kennel. And the posterior is in the bone. So there is no specific structure which you can see on the surface of the uh, petrous part of the temporal bone. Yeah. Okay, questions to this. Another figure showing the same. Yeah, so utricular ampullar nerve here, saccular nerve here, and posterior ampullar nerve here. If you know no questions, how we examine the vestibular cochlear nerve? So we can examine hearing, and for hearing we use this tuning fork. Yeah, and the tuning fork helps you to examine two kinds of hearing. One of the hearing is, uh, yeah, an, an, a normal hearing. So you put the fork here, and you can register how the external, middle, and inner ear work. Yeah. But if you touch the fork to the skull here, or to the mastoid process, for example, here, so then uh, the tuning fork starts to move the bone, and it goes directly into the inner ear. Yeah. So you can distinguish it if the problem is in inner ear, or if it's in middle ear, because if it's in middle ear, then uh, closing the tuning fork to the auricle will uh, not uh, will not irritate the hair cells in the inner ear because the problem will be here. But if you touch the skull somewhere, then it can irritate the inner ear and bypass the middle ear. Yeah. So these are so-called tuning fork examinations for hearing. That's for hearing. And then for balance, yeah, this was for hearing. Now for balance. So what do we need for balance? For balance, we need several, uh, several uh, systems. First, we need eye control, yeah? So that's first. Second, we need inner ear for balance, yeah? because it's an receptor of balance. Then we need a cerebellum, which is a manager of balance, yeah? And then you need proprioception from muscle spindles which tells you where are the muscles, so you can keep your posture, yeah? 
it's a receptor of proprioception. So you need these. And in case you have somewhere a problem, yeah, for example, in inner ear, you can have a problem. So this does not work. And you close the eyes, so you add another one. You are not able to keep balance just with proprioception and cerebellum, yeah? So that's why you can see here a guy who is, uh, who is standing behind a patient. The patient closes the eye, and if the patient starts to fall to one of the sides, there's a problem in the inner ear. And to which side you fall, it means it's the affected side, that the other side is more active and pushes the patient to the affected side. Yeah, And it's called Romberg's, Romberg's uh, sign or Romberg's examination. Yeah. So you stand and you close the eye and you fall to one of the sides. He falls to the front, does not fall to the front because you have the inner ear on the sides. Yeah, usually falls to the sides. Another one, it's called Autan. Yeah, he was a French Autan. You sit, you can try it. You sit, you stretch your arms, you close the eyes, and I can show you on the video. You sit, you stretch, you close the eyes. And then if I have problems on the left side, then my arms will fall to the left side. Yeah, they will fall like this. So that's another way how you can examine it. And another way is according to a German one, German physician, Unterberger. Yeah? You just close the eyes and you march on side. Uh, there's an example, you can uh, go for a walk into the forest, no map, no uh, roads, no paths and you can go astray, yeah, you can get lost. And you, and such people usually uh, walk in these forests in circles, in big circles, because uh, in a healthy patient, both uh, inner ears do not work uh, at the same level, yeah, as we are right-handed or left-handed, we can be also uh, right inner eared and left inner eared. That one of the uh, inner ear, one of the labyrinth, is uh, stronger and pushes you a bit to the side. And you can try it yourself. Just then, stand, close the eyes, and uh, march on side. And you will see after. Uh, half a minute or a minute that you have moved a bit to the side, yeah? Either to the left or to the right, that you have rotated a bit. Yeah? So that's that's another. So you have here three examples which you will use in your uh, daily practice if you have pa patients with uh, with balance disorders and you can you can do it anywhere. Okay, so this is the explaining of the examination. And then, which symptoms we have. As for the hearing, we can have a uh, hearing which is uh, reduced, and we call it then hip acousis and anacousis, yeah. You can see here the prepositions. And the anacousis or deafness is called, according to a French term, sourd, which is deaf, sourditas, which means deafness. Okay, you are answering here. If you, if for the Unterberge, if you walk straight, it means patient is healthy. You, yeah, do not walk, you just march on the side. Yeah, do not move, just stand. When is the deviation from the original point pathologic jury on? Yeah, you mean uh, it's it's based on uh, how many degrees you rotate to the side. Yeah, it depends on the patient how it was before, but it can be like thirty to forty-five degrees. So back here, yeah, affection of hearing that you hear uh, worse or you do not hear hypacusis, anacusis, or deafness, sorditas, and for. Balance, uh, sorry, that was uh, hearing down. 
when we have problems with the hearing that you hear in cases you do not hear and that was the question uh, someone asked before what is tinnitus tinnitus is ringing screeching humming in the ears without an external source yeah just if you are calm or if you go to sleep you just hear this all the time that's tinnitus and there are more uh, more uh, reasons for the tinnitus and that's clinical medicine so i don't go to details in this yeah so tinnitus is, is ringing screeching in in the ears as for balance of course, you know what is dizziness, vertigo. So if there's an irritation, there can be a vertigo. You can irritate it yourself when you when you rotate uh, uh, on a on a carousel, for example. Then you can feel vertigo or dizziness. Yeah, and then we can have problems with walk, which is called ataxia. Yeah, if you do not have a balance after spending ten minutes on a carousel, you do not walk very nicely yeah you can rotate on on your chair as well and then try to walk it does not work very well so it's called ataxia if you have problems with the inner ears and then another one is called nystagmus what is a nystagmus it's an involuntary eye movement it's a movement of both eyes so it's a it's a uh version movement yeah we have talked about yesterday about vergence and version so i'll try to show it again yeah so the eyes move in one and the other direction yeah we call it version movements so and if you sit in a in a train and you look out of the window and you can see a nice countryside a nice car or whatever you try to follow so you follow yeah the eyes you follow you see it, and then you skip to another object so you have this so in one direction you go very slowly following the object and then you skip to another yeah quick back in the other direction so this is so-called physiological nystagmus yeah like that but if it's pathological, it's without looking at some objects yeah, during movements. You just sit, the patient sits, you can see this. Yeah, very slow movement and then a compensation back. Compensation back. And then we call it an nystagmus, which is beating to one side. Beating means the compensation side. Yeah. So this, the slow uh, movement goes to the side which is affected. And the quick one, the beating, it's a compensating back, so you can really watch at the thing you would like to do. So this nystagmus, and you find nystagmus in irritation of uh, visual centers, uh, sorry, not visual, gaze centers, yeah, for the gaze, and irritation of cerebellum and irritation of inner ear. So it's a multi-site or multiple, multiple symptom. Okay, there is a question. Can tinnitus be a symptom of schizophrenia? I don't know, Razam. Sorry, I don't know this. How does the patient see during nystagm? Yeah, he's normal. It's just having the nystagm like that. Yeah, Or it can go down. Even there can be a rotatory nystagm like this. So now you will understand that nystagm is re related to inner ear and balance. Yeah. Okay. Some more questions? To vestibular cochlear nerve. Okay. So then we can go to uh, another three nerves, glossopharyngeal vagus accessory. So these two, uh, why does alcohol cause nystagmus? Because alcohol, uh, Alcohol uh, destroys cerebellum, and that's why it causes nystagmus. Another question, but does he know that he can focus on one object? Yeah, the patient can, uh, can if the nystagmus is smaller, then it's not a problem for the patient to live with that. But if it's severe, then the patient has problem with focusing. You have to distinguish between the physiological nystagmus and the pathological one. Yeah, the physiological, 
uh, you have when uh, you try to follow objects when moving and the pathological it's just uh, it's just there and it's there all the time yeah so it's it's uh, of course irritating the patient so now let's talk about these nerves yeah these nerves supply the third fourth and sixth pharyngeal arch even this one supplies moreover sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscle yeah i will explain this later but now we concentrate on these three pharyngeal arches and that's why these three nerves can be called lateral mixed system this term is not much used in in english literature but it helps you to understand that these three nerves supplying these three arches has uh, many common things yeah they emerge in one spot we call the spot retro olivary groove so this is pons and this is medulla oblongata yeah that's the ventral part and the dorsal part and this we called olive yeah you can see that it looks like an olive uh, in a solid and this nerve is in front of olive so it's hypoglossal because it's a somite nerve so it's more medial and these nerves are lateral more lateral so these nerves are glossopharyngeal vagus and part of accessory nerve yeah so they uh, emerge emerge behind olive uh, dorsally to olive in a retro olivary groove they have a common nuclei yeah i will show you they transmit all modalities except sympathetic as we know there are only parasympathetic fibers in the cranial nerves yeah not sympathetic and they leave the skull in foramen in jugular foramen yeah all together so what about the nuclei yeah a list of five nuclei let's talk about them in detail so as they innervate pharyngeal arches they should enable the muscles of the pharyngeal arches so we have a somatomotor nucleus which is called nucleus ambiguus yeah and it innervates the muscles which are derived from these arches so soft palate except tensor tympani do you know which nerve innervates tensor oh sorry not tensor tympani tensor veli palatini sorry tensor veli palatini which nerve innervates tensor veli palatini can you write me the answer it innervates muscles of pharynx it innervates muscles of larynx and in it innervates upper half of esophagus yeah all striated muscles no vagus nerve is one of these vagus nerve that's why i do not ask about that and yeah, this is vagus nerve this is glossopharyngeal and vagus and part of accessory nerve mandibular yes mandibular that's perfect tensor veli palatin is supplied by mandibular nerve yeah okay so these are somato motor uh, fibers yeah for soft palate except tensor veli palatini for pharyngeal muscles laryngeal muscles and upper half of esophagus so striated muscles then we have visceromotor yeah and we know that visceral motor are only parasympathetic so which glands are left as i said parotid gland and parotid gland is innervated by glossopharyngeal and close to parotid gland are buccal glands yeah inside the mucosa of the oral cavity in the extent of the cheek and they use a ganglion within a uh, infratemporal fossa which is called otic ganglion and that's the last ganglion we have not talked about yeah we have talked about ciliary ganglion yesterday and today about pterygopalatine and submandibular ganglion for facial nerve and otic ganglion for glossopharyngeal nerve parasympathetic fibers parasympathetic fibers of the vagus nerve they supply what the vagus nerve supply and now we can 
try to summarize it. So it supplies foregut and midgut. As far as the point of canon BM, that means to the left colic flexure. Yeah. It supplies what is derived from foregut. That's lower respiratory tract, larynx, trachea, bronchi. Yeah. It supplies, of course, heart, and the function is to uh, reduce all the functions in, in the heart, yeah? So the heart rate goes down, and the contractility goes down, and the transmission rate goes down. It innervates, of course, pharynx, yeah? Because it innervates the pharyngeal arches, so it innervates the pharynx. And it also helps to innervate thymus. And which structures there? Smooth muscles, because it's viscero, it's parasympathetic, and glands. So glands and smooth muscles in foregut and midgut, lower respiratory tract, pharynx, heart and thymus. So when this is visceromotor, then we have from the same organs viscerosensation. Yeah? So the viscerosensation comes from foregut and midgut, lower respiratory tract, yeah? of course heart and thymus, and organs which are also related to this area, spleen, because it develops in the dorsal mesogastrium, yeah? close to uh, stomach, kidneys, suprarenal glands, and testes and ovaries because they are located in retroperitoneum in the same area where the vagus nerve uh, comes. Yeah, I will show you on a figure how it's like that and we will talk about this in uh, autonomic nervous system as well. Yeah, and it, uh, from ovaries, it reaches also part of the uterine tubes. What is the innervation of the rest of the components of the digestive system after the splenic flexure? The Parasympathetic innervation comes from S2 to S4 to something which is called inferior hypogastric plexus. Maybe you have heard this term during the study of the erectum, and we will talk about this plexus in detail in autonomic system. Yeah. So this is a visceral sensation. So for example, if you eat too much food, then you can feel uh, extended stomach, for example. And it also involves taste, and we have talked about the gustatory nucleus for facial nerve, so the taste comes to the gustatory nucleus, which is part of the solitary tract nucleus. And there is also a somatos sensation, yeah? And the somatos sensation come from a small areas of external acoustic meatus, yeah? for the vagus, for small part of meninges around the jugular foramen, yeah, again by vagus, and then from tongue, yeah, by vagus and glossopharyngeal nerve. So this is just to summarize. So when you study the, uh, the nerves, read this, and then at the end, after learning all the branches, come to this again and summarize using this yeah so let's talk about the special nerves now the glossopharyngeal one we have talked about the retro olivary groove where it leaves the brainstem then it goes through the jugular foramen so you can see this is the jugular foramen yeah and then it leaves it out and there are two ganglia and we call it superior and inferior ganglion and these are the viscerosensory and somatosensory ganglia. And then there are some branches. Okay. When it's called glossopharyngeal nerve, it innervates the skin, oh, sorry, mucosa, I'm sorry, mucosa of the tongue, yeah, at the root of the tongue, that means here. This area is vagus, this area is lingual nerve, so in it's in between, yeah? So it innervates here, the mucosa, and of course, it also innervates 
the taste. Don't forget the valet papillae, which are here. So it also innervates the taste buds in the area of the root and valet papillae. Okay, so these are the lingual branches. Glossopharyngeal, it innervates pharynx and it innervates the mucosa and glands of, of upper half of the pharynx approximately. There is no, no, uh, no uh, precise line, yeah? Approximately upper half. And it also innervates one muscle for pharynx. And that's the only, only somatomotor fibers to an, only one muscle by this nerve, still a pharyngeal, yeah? So that's glossopharyngeal. Then we have some smaller branches. Some smaller branches come to here, to the carotid sinus and to carotid body, but mainly to carotid sinus. Yeah? And these areas are baro and chemoreceptors. Yeah? Baro and chemoreceptors. So it informs you about the blood pressure and the oxygen level which goes into the brain. Yeah? So the glossopharyngeal nerve together with the vagus nerve as well, brings the information from this sinus and body, carotid sinus and body, which are baro and chemoreceptors, giving you the information about the blood pressure and uh, level of oxygen coming to the brain. Well, Another branch is tonsillar branch, yeah, for the palatine tonsil. And the palatine tonsil is innervated by two nerves, glossopharyngeal and maxillary. Yeah, so this is palatine tonsil. So pay attention to that. If you operate, you need to, to apply the anesthesia around because you have two nerves coming, maxillary nerve and glossopharyngeal nerve, yeah, to the mucosa of the palatine tonsil. Would a defect in sinus carotidsy branch be lethal? No, no, it won't be lethal. Because we have other chemoreceptors and baroreceptors in the body. And the last one is this complicated situation. Yeah, and you, rem you may remember these structures. So, when I'll try to draw it, we have the tympanic cavity, yeah. And you remember there was a canal coming from below and it was called a uh, tympanic canaliculus. The tympanic canaliculus transmit the tympanic nerve, which is a branch from glossopharyngeal. Yeah? So it gets in the nerve, forms a plexus here, which is called a tympanic plexus. Yeah, you can see it here. And it supplies the mucosa of the tympanic cavity here and also the mucosa of uh, auditory tube, yeah? which is here. And then it can continue in the roof because other fibers go here and continue as lesser petrosal nerve. Yeah, lesser petrosal nerve. And they continue to otoganglion. And from the otoganglion, they continue into which gland? Write me the answer, please. Into which gland they continue? We have talked about this twice, so you should know the answer. Parotid gland, perfect, parotid gland. And with the parotid gland, also the small glands which are close. Do you know the answer? Which are close, buccal gland, perfect. Yes, you are a great audience. You worked with me nicely. Okay, yeah, so. And now we know the whole, whole glossopharyngeal nerve. So I go again through that. Somatomotor is only one muscle, yeah? Still a pharyngeal. Visceromotor is for the glands. 
for the glands which are on the root of the tongue, which are in the pharynx, and which are here, the parotid gland and buccal gland. Somatosensory, yeah, coming from uh, the mucosa, which is on the tongue, which is in the pharynx, which is on the tonsilla, yeah. Taste, again, from the tongue here, yeah, plus the valet papilla. And visceral sensation, carotid sinus, yeah. That's it. And, sorry, I have forgotten this. Somato sensation, of course, somato sensation coming via the tympanic nerve from the tympanic cavity. So it innervates the mucosa here. So here, the, this slide just summarizes what we have talked about. And I would draw the attention again to the most complicated, which is the branching into the tympanic cavity. Yeah, tympanic nerve coming from below together with the in inferior tympanic artery forming a plexus going up as a lesser petrosal nerve together with the superior tympanic artery and supplying parotid gland and buccal glands via otic ganglion where it's synapsed. Yeah? And it's called Jakobson anastomosis. He was Danish, so not Jacobson, but Jakobson. Yeah? So question to glossopharyngeal nerve. Yeah, the somato sensation and the sensory area, of course, including the valet papilla, yeah? So it should be like this. This is the proper, proper shape. And there can be a policy, yeah? And the policy can cause problems in swallowing, mild, problems because there is only one muscle and it's still a pharyn uh, still a pharyngeal muscle yeah it's one of the levators of the pharynx so mild dysphagia mild problem with following uh, no afferentation in vomiting reflex why because if you would like to vomit you try to touch the area of the root of the tongue yeah and if it does not work then you have problems in vomiting and then the other fibers, taste, gland, sensory fibers, uh, they are weak symptoms of these, so uh, they are not detected in clinics. So uh, the policy, which is quite rare, is just mild dysphagia and problems with vomiting. But if it's irritated, yeah, we have a neuralgia as it's a somatosensory nerve. And this neuralgia can cause pain in two areas which are supplied by the nerve. And we have talked about half of the tonsil and middle ear, yeah, middle ear. This is via tympanic nerve, and this is via pharyngeal branches. So the patient comes and says, I have a pain in my throat, and he means the tonsil, and in my ear, and he means the middle ear, yeah? But of course the patient cannot distinguish these small details. But this is also much rarer than a neuralgia of the trigeminal nerve. So you won't meet uh, so many patients with problems of glossopharyngeal as trigeminal or vagus. And here's a rare case of a big, uh, big tumor of uh, the sheath cells of Schwann cells. So this is schwannoma of the glossopharyngeal nerve, yeah? shown on MRI. Just uh, an example of what can happen. But as I say, it's quite, uh, it's quite rare. Can the symptoms be confused with cold? Uh, of course not, because the symptoms lack any inflammation, yeah? And if you look into the throat, you do not see any, any, any cover uh, on the tonsils. It's just a pain, yeah. Okay, vagus nerve. 
And this is just a summarizing of what we have talked about before. So, somatomotor, that means striated muscle, pharynx, except stylopharyngeal, as it's applied by glossopharyngeal. Soft palate, except tensor valley palatini, as it's applied by mandibular. All the muscles of the larynx and upper half of the esophagus. Yeah, not a problem with that. Visceromotor. Yeah, that means parasympathetic because it's a cranial nerve. Glands and smooth muscles off. Pharynx, foregut, midgut. From foregut, what is developed? Lower respiratory tract, heart, thymus. Yeah. So that's for motor. For sensory, viscerosensory comes from the same area. Yeah. So larynx, pharynx, foregut, midgut. Uh, heart, I don't have heart here, sorry. You should add heart. And then what is um, related to foregut? That means liver, gallbladder, pancreas, which are developed as pouches of foregut. Spleen developing within the posterior mesogastrium. And kidney, supralenal glands, testis ovaris, which are close to uh, where the vagus nerve branches, yeah? And then somatosensation is quite small areas, as I said, ex external acoustic meters and meninges close to jugular foramen, yeah? And special sensory is a taste and taste in the extent of the root of the tongue close to epiglottis. So here, close to epiglottis, quite small area. So now you can see that Vegas is not so complicated. Of course, if you know all the organs which we have studied during respiratory and GIT, yeah, so that's the area what the vagus supplies. Here you can see the small area of the root of the tongue and the lingual surface of epiglottis. So taste and somatosensation, yeah, both modalities from this surface. Well, now course of the vagus nerve. It can be a bit complicated, but I think it won't be, yeah. So it leaves through the I'll change the color. It leaves through the jugular foramen. So we have the jugular foramen here. You can see the upper and uh, superior and inferior ganglion, yeah, which is somatosensory and viscerosensory as for the glossopharyngeal. And then it goes down in the neck, thorax, and it passes through uh, esophageal hi hiatus of the diaphragm. Yeah, and then here you can see it forms a plexus close to aorta. Yeah, you can see the plexus here. It goes into the plexus and it's called uh, abdominal aortic plexus. And it's a mixed plexus of parasympathetic fibers, which comes from vagus, and sympathetic fibers. Do you know any sympathetic nerve in the in the human body? A big sympathetic nerve? Could you write me? At least two two examples. And I think if you know them, these are the nerves which brings the sympathetic fibers to this mixed plexus. Yeah. So this plexus is mixed. So it's parasympathetic and sympathetic together. We will talk about this in the autonomic system. Don't worry. It's just to make it clear. Okay, no idea about that. Yes, thoracic splachnic nerve, perfect. And the thoracic splachnic nerves are branches from sympathetic trunk, yeah? So thoracic splachnic nerves brings the information here to this plexus. And vagus brings here parasympathetic innervation. 
You can see that the vagus forms a plexus on esophagus, and you may know it already that the left vagus is ventrally and the right vagus is dorsally. Yeah, left vagus ventrally, right vagus dorsally. And then it forms two uh, trunks which enters into uh, the abdominal cavity, anterior and posterior vagal trunks. Anterior is of course from the left, posterior from the right vagus nerve. So what is the topography as a whole? So we start in the cranial, posterior cranial fossa. We go through the jugular foramen and we get to the neck. And in neck, we are in parapharyngeal space. And you know the parapharyngeal space from the section of the neck. It's a space on the side of pharynx and then later on the side of esophagus. And if you go up, it is divided by a styloid septum into retro and pre-styloid space. Yeah, I will show this on a figure. There's a question, plexus esophagus is vagus and glossopharyngeal. No, 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 of course not glossopharyngeal as we have um, used the glossopharyngeal already for the tongue and uh, pharynx. So on esophagus, it's only vagus. Now we talk about only vagus nerve, yeah? Styloid septum, yeah, yeah, styloid septum is here. The styloid septum consists of stylohyoid ligament, which is attached to styloid process, yeah? So stylohyoid ligament. And then the muscles, which is ventral to it. Styloglossus and stylopharyngeal muscles, yeah, these two. And dorsally, stylohyoid muscle, running together with the stylohyoid ligament. Together running posterior belly of digastric, and we have talked about the innervation of these two, which is facial nerve, yeah? We have talked about stylopharyngeal innervation, which is glossopharyngeal. And we will talk about styloglossus when it's an extraglossal, it's innervated by hypoglossal. And then close to it is sternocleidomastoid, innervated by accessory. So all these nerves you find here, you can see them, some of them not because they have already supplied the muscles, but majority of them you can see here. Yeah. This is level of uh, C2, so some of them already already uh, left and supplied the muscles like glossopharyngeal nerve, yeah? And what you see here more is so-called carotid vagina. Yeah, the carotid vagina or carotid sheath contains internal carotid artery and internal jugular vein, vagus nerve, and superior root of deep cervical anza. So this is retrostyloid space. What is in uh, pre-styloid space? Pre-styloid space is a continuation of infratemporal fossa. So you have here some structures of the infratemporal fossa, like pterygoid muscles. Yeah. So this is pre-styloid space. And in pre-styloid space, you have external carotid artery. In the retrostyloid, you have the internal carotid artery. Yeah, about this space we will talk more during uh, dissections, but you can understand it uh, now passively. So it goes through the, I'm sorry, through the retrostyloid space, which continues as a parapharyngeal space. Then we get into thorax, yeah? The in thoracic inlet, or superior thoracic aperture. We get into superior mediastinum, then into posterior inferior mediastinum, and via esophageal hiatus of diaphragm, we get into the abdominal cavity, and it reaches as far as the point of canon B, which is at the left colic flexure. So you understand this course of the vagus nerve, which is also visible here a bit. Okay, if you understand that, uh, there's another, uh, some other branches we should talk about. So meningeal branch is a very small branch to supply meninges 
uh, in the vicinity of the jugular foramen. But majority of meninges, 95%, is supplied by trigeminal nerve. Yeah? So the trigeminal nerve is the main nerve for meninges. And then we have the auricular branch. Yeah? The auricular branch. I'll go back to this nice uh, scheme. Quite complicated, but you can see the auricular branch. The auricular branch is branching in the uh, jugular foramen. Yeah, so we are in the jugular foramen, and it's branching here, and that's something which is called mastoid canaliculus, very small one. Yeah, and this mastoid canaliculus runs uh, through the bone to tympanomastoid fissure. Yeah. I may have asked some of you also to show me these. Because then this innervates uh, a small part of the ear. I will show you which part. You can see it here on this figure. So it innervates this part of the auricle, which is called concha. Yeah? If you know the petrol station and the company Shell, yeah, concha is in English a shell. Yeah. So this part is called concha shell. It should remind you of, of the shell which they have in, in their sign. And it also supplies part of uh, part of the external acoustic meatus. And in this case, you can see here the herpes zoster. Yeah. Herpes zoster. You may know that herpes zoster causes blisters in the intercostal spaces, for example. Yeah, it's a viral infection, and it can cause also problem in the ophthalmic uh, nerve area, as I showed you, as I showed you uh, yesterday. Uh, you may remember that the patient has problem here, and there can be problems with the cornea and conjunctiva it can lead to blindness. Yeah? Here it's not so severe, but you can see uh, the blisters and the eruption of blisters in the area of the concha and external acoustic meatus. And the, nerve, the area is called Remsen, Remsey Hunt Zone. Yeah? Sir Remsey Hunt was an English lord 100 years ago who described it. But it's, the nerve is also called Arnold nerve, or in some English-speaking countries, Alderman's nerve. Yeah? And you may irritate this vagus area by your ear sticks. If you use the ear stick, you can feel some problems of the vagus nerve irritation. For example, um, some tickling in, in your throat, or you can start to cough. And in some sensitive patients, you can even have problems with the blood pressure that it can go down and the heart rate can be slowed down. Yeah, If you irritate the area of concha and mainly external acoustic meatus. Yeah? So please remember that the vagus nerve supplies this area. Then some other branches, they are not so complicated. Pharyngeal branches for pharynx, cardiac branches for the heart. And we have three of them, superior cervical, inferior cervical, and some thoracic, yeah? So they come in, uh, in, in a series. Some for the lungs, which are called bronchial, and then hepatic, renal, gastric, and celiac for celiac, plexus and celiac plexus then uh, helps to supply the foregut and midgut. And I have skipped this one and I think it's not a problem for you after respiratory system we have superior laryngeal and inferior laryngeal. Superior laryngeal innervates mucosa of upper of upper half of larynx. Uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve the inferior half of the larynx as for the mucosa and glands, yeah? And as for the muscles, the superior laryngeal innervates only one muscle. Can you write the name of the muscle which it innervates? Still 27 people alive here with me. 
So I'm waiting for the muscle innervated by superior laryngeal nerve, only one muscle of the larynx. No one. Cricothyroid, perfect, Katarina. Cricothyroid, perfect, Mireille. Yeah? And recurrent, lar recurrent laryngeal nerve innervates uh, the rest of them. What is the difference between right and left? Back to embryology. And we know that we have the pharyngeal arches. And from the fourth pharyngeal arch, the aorta is formed. And we have left-sided aorta. Yes, all the mammalia has got left-sided aorta. And that's why the left laryngeal nerve has to go down and up. And if you imagine a giraffe, the giraffe has got very long left thoracic, left recurrent laryngeal nerve, yeah? Because it's a mammal. The right one is not so long, it just has to go under the subclavian artery here, yeah? So remember, the left and right uh, recurrent laryngeal nerves are of different length. Okay, so we have talked about all the branches. And now the policy. Of course, the policy, because the muscles uh, of pharynx and soft palate are innervated by vagus nerve, it's problem with swallowing, yeah? It innervates the muscles of the larynx, so problems with the voice. It innervates the heart, so the problem with the blood pressure. Uh, and I said it innervates the soft palate, so a deviation of uvula, I will show you in a figure. If it's bilateral, of course you have problems with dysphagia, but you have problems with the speech because the vocal uh, uh, vocal cords do not move. Uh, the soft play does not move, so you speak like a French, nothing against French students, but you speak like French in this way, which is called rhinolalia, speech via nose. And you can have problems with blood pressure, again, yeah, hypertension. Even if it's uh, really severe, there can be a stopped breathing, yeah, due to close closure of the uh, rima glottidis, the cleft of the vocal folds. On the contrary, if you irritate the nerve, you have more effect on the heart, so bradycardia, even you can stop the heart beating. And there can be spasms of the smooth uh, muscles, mainly sphincters, on the circular layer of the muscle layer of the GIT, yeah? So in GIT, esophagus or in pylorus and laryngospasm as well, yeah? As larynx is also innervated by vagus nerve. So what you can you see in the patient is this, yeah, anterior pillar underlined by palatoglossus muscle and uvula, and on the affected side, it's called a sign of a curtain. Yeah, it's like a curtain in a theater that the curtain is dropped down. So this is sign of a curtain, and the uvula is deviated to the side. So this is a nice sign of uh, policy of vagus nerve. So questions to the policy. And then uh, how you can examine the vagus nerve very easily. You try the vomiting reflex, yeah? You touch the uh, root of the tongue and you try the vomiting reflex. And there's another reflex, which is sometimes used in clinics, which is called oculocardial reflex, yeah? You can watch at me, you uh, touch with your, um, with your thumbs, the eyeball, and you compress it. When you compress it, is, it is, of course, painful because you compress the trigeminal nerve. But the trigeminal nerve then irritates in the reticular formation of the brain stem, also the vagus nerve, and it can cause the bradycardia. So it is used uh, in clinics in patients with tachycardia when the heart is running too much and you would like to slow it very quickly. You, tr you compress it and you can cause some bradycardia and the heart beats uh, uh, ratio is reduced. Yeah, so it's called Ashner Danini reflex or oculocardial reflex. It's quite complex reflex, but it's, it's used in clinics. 
And uh, experimentally, it was found that if we have an epilepsy or depression, which is resistant to pharmacotherapy, yeah, we can stimulate, uh, chronically, we can stimulate the vagus nerve using this subcutaneous pulse generator and the electrode, and it can help in some kinds of epilepsy and depression, which are resistant to pharmacotherapy, yeah? So like a, like a last chance to do something. So it's not used, of course, uh, commonly. Okay, that was the vagus nerve. Uh, do you want a short break or should we continue? I think it's like for 20 minutes more, maybe 15. Okay, so we can have a break, break 10 minutes. A break 10 minutes and then we continue, yeah? And we should talk to uh, we should talk about the accessory nerve. Why the nerve is called accessory? It's accessory to uh, vagus nerve. Yeah, as I would like to show you in a in a figure uh, when I draw it. Yeah, it's accessory to the vagus nerve. So the old name of the nerve was accessory to vagus nerve. And it's a bit problem that this nerve is uh, two nerves combined together. They just grow together into one. Yeah. So I will skip to, um, to a whiteboard to draw it somehow. Yeah. Okay. So as you know. Uh, from the muscles, the accessory nerve innervates sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles. Yeah, so it innervates it. Where it starts? It starts from a nucleus, and this nucleus is at the level of C1 to level C6. And if you have studied properly, there are some fibers which comes from uh, C6 to C7 from the nucleus, which is located in spinal cord directly. So the innervation of sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscle is accessory nerve, which is here. and C2 to C3, yeah? So we may call it the diploneural muscles, but they are not diploneural because it's a one nucleus, does just the fibers diverge and then they converge. It gets back into the cavity through the foramen magnum, yeah, in the cranial cavity. And then it gets out from the cranial cavity through the jugular foramen. Yeah? So this is jugular foramen. And this is a somite somatomotor nerve. Yeah? So this is quite easy. And then we have the other part, which is branchial somatomotor, supplying the sixth pharyngeal arch. So the nucleus is the same nucleus as for vagus and glossopharyngeal, so it's called a nucleus ambiguous. And I'll come back to this. This is called the nucleus of accessory nerve, yeah? Just to, to give you the name of the nucleus. And you can imagine here the vagus nerve. So this is a vagus nerve. But there are some fibers which go this way.
and then back to vagus nerve. So you can see that they form together accessory nerve. So this is the trunk of accessory nerve. But the trunk is formed by two roots. Yeah, we call this root. And this is a cranial root and this is a spinal root. Yeah. We call them roots in Latin radix. Yeah. And you may know these roots or radix maybe from a spinal nerve that we have anterior and posterior one. And then the nerve branches into branches, which we call rami, yeah? Like in spinal nerve, you have anterior and posterior ramus in here as well. And you have so-called internal and external. So then the nerve has got a very easy scheme like this and like this. Yeah, two nerves which are for a while running together. Yeah, with the vagus and here with the direct branches C2 to C4. Okay, so I go back to the presentation. And again, to repeat it, we have for the sixth arch. The branchial part comes from the nucleus ambiguous, which is the somatomotor nucleus for glossopharyngeal and vagus and accessory nerve. Forms the cranial root, runs in the trunk, forms the internal branch, rejoins the vagus and supplies some muscles and supplies soft palate muscles. Yeah, so the palato, glossus palato, pharyngeus musculus of uvula and uh, levator belly palatini and supplies the lateral group of laryngeal muscles which is teroarytenoid muscle vocalis muscle and lateral cricoarytenoid muscle yeah so these two group of muscles are supplied by accessory nerve but by its cranial root and internal branch. On the contrary, the somite area coming from C1 to C6 nucleus, yeah, so quite an extensive nucleus, which is called nucleus of accessory nerve. It forms a spinal root, gets into the trunk, leaves it as an external branch, and supplies two muscles, sternocleidomastoid and trapezoid. And it's accompanied, yeah, or sorry, the, the, there, there are some auxiliary uh, uh, fibers via the spinal nerve C2 to C4, yeah? So I'll back, go back to, to this again. Yeah, and I talk about this at the end. So do you have a question to, to this arrangement? Why it happens? Uh, it happens uh, and it's similar to hypoglossal nerve by the hypoglossal nerve is also uh, in the manner we will talk about that uh, the head started to be developed later than the somites and then the skull extended and it uh, overlapped the area of the first somites and some of the somites and their nerves are grown into the skull which is valid for the parts of accessory and the hypoglossal nerve. Yeah? They are somite nerves which innervate some muscles which are related to somites and they are grown into, they are taken into the skull and then they have to leave the skull again. So if you have another question to that. Can you explain the spinal root of accessory nerve again, please? Here you can see the spinal root, yeah? So, the spinal root comes from C1 to C6 segments, yeah? C1 to C6. It forms one spinal root, enters the, the skull in, uh, via foramen magnum, 
joins the cranial root, leaves via jugular foramen, and continues as the external ramus to supply sternocleidomastoid and trapezoid muscles. Yeah, and the same you can see here for Amen Magnum and the spinal root, the cranial root, the trunk. And these are the fibers C2 to C4, which goes directly into the muscles. Yeah, so this is again the external branch, the internal branch joins the vagus nerve. So it's here. Okay. And this is clear. Then the palsy. The palsy of the internal branch, palsy of the internal branch affects, as I said, soft palate, yeah, the four muscles of the soft palate, and three muscles of the larynx, but for the larynx it's not so important, so you have problems with the soft palate which is problems with the swallowing and, spe swallowing and speech and uvula is depressed and deviated and then depressed pharyngeal arches. That means the uh, symptom of, of a curtain. Yeah, symptom of a curtain. So that's a policy of the internal branch which joins then the vagus. And policy of the external branch is then problem with uh, the uh, abduction above the horizontal plane. There are two muscles performing abduction above the horizontal plane. One is trapezius and the other, could you write the name of the other one? Uh, the trapezius also fix scapula, so if it does not work, not suprascapularis, no. Suprascapularis is performing abduction of the arm, but towards the horizontal plane. Levator scapulae, no, it's a antagonist. So it's performing internal rotation of the scapula. So uh, then it's performing adduction of the abducted scapula. We need a muscle performing external rotation. Yes, Christoph, it's anterior serratus muscle. But this muscle is not strong enough to uh, perform the abduction above the horizontal plane if you have a weight in, in your uh, arm, yeah? So the abduction above the horizontal plane is, is very restrained and we have a bit depressed shoulder and winged scapula. How the winged scapula looks like, you can see on these figures, yeah? The winged scapula or scapula alata in Latin. And a policy of, of both branches are, it's, it's a very rare policy because the trunk is very short. There should be a problem uh, within the jugular foramen to compress the whole nerve. So, any question to the accessory nerve? I hope everything is clear. And we can move to the last, which is hypoglossal, yeah? And you can see here, the occipital somites, which are of no use when the skull is developed. So they moved ventrally and they moved to form the muscles of the tongue. So long thoracic nerve is a branch of accessory? Of course not. Of course not because uh, long thoracic nerve is a branch of brachial plexus and we have two separate muscles performing the same movement, the abduction of the arm above the horizontal plane, which is trapezius, innervated by accessory nerve, external branch, and serratus anterior, innervated by long thoracic nerve. But I said that serratus anterior is weaker for that, uh, as it is located below the scapula, so it has not the power to extend it uh, so high above, yeah, to perform the whole abduction. Trapezius is the more principal muscle for this movement and stronger muscle. So the hypoglossal nerve is a very easy nerve, yeah? It's a somite somatomotor and it just supplies seven muscles of the tongue. How it runs? It 
as it as somite nerve, it emerges medially, so ventral to olive, yeah, in a pre-olivary groove. I said the dorsal to olive emerges the branchial vagus glossopharyngeal and accessory nerves, yeah. So it's in pre-olivary groove. It gets into posterior cranial fossa, has to go out through the hypoglossal canal together with the venous plexus of the hypoglossal canal gets into retrostyloid space, so the same space as the vagus glossopharyngeal and accessory. And then you can see it running in the upper corner of carotid triangle and it gets into submandibular triangle and it's close to the tongue and it supplies muscles of the tongue. We can see it here, yeah, as it emerges. Uh, in front of the olive, so pre-olivary groove, via the hypoglossal canal it gets out, and it runs in a carotid triangle, yeah, gets into submandibular triangle, and then into the tongue. It is accompanied by a vein, yeah, a commutating vein or, or accompanying vein of the hypoglossal nerve. Well, it's not so easy as you can see here. It is uh, accompanied by another branch. Here we have something which is called cervical anza or sometimes deep cervical anza. Anza cervicalis profunda. Yeah? How this anza is formed, you can see it here. Yeah? Here we have C1, C2, and C3. So the ANSA is formed by fibers from these three segments. And you can see that C1, C2 goes together here and joins the hypoglossal nerve. Run a while here and then leaves it again as a radix superior, superior root yeah, of the ANSA. C2 to C3 also send branches here and leaves it separately as the inferior root, yeah, radix inferior. And then they join like this and supply muscles. Which muscles? Sternohyoid, sternothyroid, and omohyoid are three long muscles below hyoid bone, so they are also called infrahyoid muscles, yeah, innervated by C1 to C3 via the deep cervical ansa. Why it's like that? As I said, hypoglossal nerve is a somite nerve and it, it has to be, it, it used, uh, sorry, it was taken into the skull, it grown into the skull, so the level of the skull is somewhere here, but still the nerve behave as a somite one, yeah, so it forms something like a plexus and you know uh, cervical plexus yeah well there's an exception for the innervation c1 sends the branches like this to two muscles one of them is geniohyoid and you know it as a suprahyoid muscle yeah geniohyoid or geniohyoid uh, it originates on the uh, inferior mental spine and therohyoid. And therohyoid is a infrahyoid muscle. These two are two. These two are small and they are located quite superior. That's why they are innervated only by C1. Yeah, not by the whole answer. So the hypoglossal nerve is morphologically grown together with the C1 and C2 fibers. Yeah, for these muscles. This branch, and this branch, so the superior root of the ANSA used to be also called a descending branch of hypoglossal nerve. As you can see it, it really descends from the nerve. And if you do not understand, uh, if you do not uh, know uh, which fibers is which, you just can consider it as a descending branch of hypoglossal nerve. So it's an old term and we don't use it because it's not precise. Yeah? So 
to summarize, the hypoglossal nerve innervates all intraglossal muscles, so superior and inferior longitudinal, vertical, and transverse, and three extraglossal genioglossus or genioglossus originating on superior mental spine, hyoglossus and styloglossus. Why not palatoglossus? Because palatoglossus is a muscle of the soft palate as well, so it's innervated by vagus nerve. Yeah, and as you look here, you can see uh, the muscles which are innervated by vagus. Oh, sorry, <laughs> which are innervated by a hypoglossal nerve, and then the genioid, which is innervated by C1. And C1 is just a below hypoglossal, yeah? So now you may remember that. Okay, and the last slide is showing the policy of the uh, hypoglossal nerve, yeah? This is unilateral policy, and as you can read in the name, Plegia is a policy, hemi means half, and glossa means tongue. So we have a policy of half of the tongue, as you can see here, this is the uh, affected side. So the muscles are weakened here, yeah, there is no tension in the muscle, no tonus. So the healthy half of the tongue pushes it uh, to the other side. Yeah, so if you ask the patient, please show the tongue, then the tongue is deviated to the side of affection. Yeah, very easily you can distinguish this policy. Questions to hypoglossal nerve or to all cranial nerves, I can answer now. Thank you very much for being here with me and paying attention. I think I have exhausted you, but I hope it, it helped you. And then you can uh, continue into seminaries with Azat al Redwan. He will talk in detail about the branches of the trigeminal nerve, which we have skipped. And he will also concentrate on the facial and vagus nerve again, as they are complicated. And he will answer your questions. You're welcome. It was a pleasure to, to have a chance to talk. Uh, I think in half an hour I will add the the audio and video to the website, yeah? Okay. Can you add pictures on different slides because it covers all the text? Yes, yes, I will, I will go through the uh, PowerPoint presentation in the meantime and I will arrange it and so within one hour you will have both the video and PPT on the website, yes? Okay, so if you have no question, thank you very much for paying attention and uh, I stop recording.